I mean, I guess the point is you are, we are sometimes imposters, right? And that's fine. Hey there, and welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. And today we are continuing our conversation about women in science with Dr. Marla Feller, a neuroscientist at the University of California at Berkeley. I'm your host, Allison Lewis, a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. And my name is Sandra Fendler. I recently defended my PhD at the Max Planck Institute of Neurobiology in Munich. So in our last episode, we talked to Marla about what it would what it was like to be a woman in a field dominated by men and the liberating feeling when more women joined the room. We also talked about balancing being a parent with being a scientist and the important role childcare can play in leveling the playing field for men and women in science. Today we are talking to Marla about overcoming gender bias in research and how after years of being a professor at Berkeley, she finally got over her imposter syndrome. So without any further ado, we welcome back Marla Feller. How long have you been a PI at Berkeley? Uh, let's see. So I have been at Berkeley. I was, that's so funny. I was going to look that up because I think the answer I had was incorrect. What I might've told you before. So um, I have been at Berkeley since oh 2007 so how many years is that that is now 13 years 14 14 years and before that i was at the university of california in san diego for seven years and before that i started my independent career at the national institutes of health as an independent investigator there and i was only there for two years are you from berkeley also were you born and raised there or no no i was born in new jersey on the East okay. Coast and mm -hmm. um, moved a lot as a kid. And I um, was in high school in Southern California. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually started college at UCLA, but then I transferred to Berkeley. So, um, so I, I wasn't, I wasn't born here, but I loved it. It has mm -hmm. this kind of, particularly for my teenage self, it had this counterculture <laughs> era about it that I really liked. And I somehow haven't yeah. gotten over that, I guess. <laughs> Uh, now going back as a PI, does it kind of live up to everything you remembered as a student or? Well, it changes, you know, as you go through life. So as I was here as an undergraduate, um, I was here as a graduate student and then I left for a few years. And then I actually, I, le I did a postdoc at Bell Labs in, uh, in New Jersey. And then I came back for a second postdoc at Berkeley with uh, Carla Schatz, and then I left again, and now I was away longer, and then came back as a professor. And every time you come back, I sort of came back in a different stage of my life, and I felt like Berkeley had something kind of unique to offer. You know, when I came back as a faculty member, I had a little kid, and, and sorry, I had no idea that um, Berkeley had great playgrounds, you know, <laughs> but it turns out they even have great playgrounds, you know. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so you've moved around a bit as a PI. Yes. Does that, when, when you're applying for new, like, do you apply for new positions? Is it like intimidating every time you have to do it again? Or like, once you get to a certain point, is it like people are asking you to come to them? Yeah, that it would be nice. So the, um, uh, so the first, you know, time I interviewed, it was of course very intimidating. Uh, and, um, and I had some successful interviews and some miserably failed interviews. Um, and, but things worked out very nicely at the National Institute of Health, and I was very excited to go there. Um, and I love being there. Uh, I, um, at that point, and still am married to another neuroscientist, and he did not like um, his position at the National Institute of Health. I think he was fine with his position there, but really wanted to be at a university. He went as a postdoc, so I was a little bit further ahead in my career. So he was an independent postdoc kind of did a big project and then was ready to go on the job market. And one of the places, luckily there was a job at the NIH and I'm like, okay, that's plan A. But he, we also interviewed at universities and really um, had wonderful interview interviews at UC San Diego. And so I was very reluctant to leave my wonderful position after two years, but um, we did and we went uh, to San Diego. And so there we had, you know, 
it was a wonderful place to do um, uh, neuroscience. Wonderful department, incredibly supportive colleagues. Uh, but then we got, then we started getting asked by a couple places to interview at that point. Um, and in, in my case, I sort of felt like uh, maybe there being two of us was helpful because there were these places that were trying to really build up neuro in their departments and they kind of get a, two people they can negotiate for at the same time. And it was in that process that we ended up moving to Berkeley which is where I had gone to college and where I had gone to graduate school and where I always really wanted to live. So for me, it's kind of a dream come true. Wow. So Marla's had a really impressive career and I actually find it really encouraging that she's been so successful in so many environments from physics to biology and also in many institutions. Um, there's this expression that you rise to your level of incompetence. I, have you heard of this expression? Not really, actually. I mean, I kind of get the idea, I think, but yeah. So what this basically means is like, as long as you're good at your job, you'll keep getting promoted. But then once you're in a position you aren't good at, that's actually where you stay. And I've always found this really sad. But uh with it, basically, like with every new stage in my career, I'm, I'm constantly asking myself, like, have you reached this point? Have you reached the level of your incompetence? And so it's just so nice to hear of a woman who's a tree, who's achieved her dream job in science, because sometimes this feels so out of reach. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I was also wondering, because last time we talked so much about her role as a mother and a scientist. But I'm also wondering, just because what you said now, her career sounds very smooth. Like everything she told us now um, sounds as if, yeah, she went from one step to the next and it all made sense. And then again, last time we talked about the aspects of uh, and the difficulties she maybe had as a mother. But I'm also wondering how it was just to be a woman and become a scientist and go through all of these different steps. And I'm also wondering if she... if how her, her experience was and if she ever faced any discrimination or even sexism and how she dealt with it. Yeah, we should ask her that. Like, let's hear what Marla has to say about if, if her career really was this easy or if she faced any kind of discrimination. So Marla, I was wondering if you ever faced any hurdles in your career because you're a woman or do you think so? And have you ever felt discriminated against and when in your career or over time? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, and, and I do think, uh, so back in the physics world, you know, when I would go around to talk to faculty about joining their labs, there were mm -hmm. explicitly people who would say, I, I don't take women into my lab. They're too emotional. Oh, wow. um, I mean, wow. if, you know, okay. women's brains are different. You know, they think differently. I, it was awful, right? And so, so... So I, I have to, and I'm trying to recalibrate as time goes on and not become one of those mm -hmm. people like, oh, you think you had a bad, let me tell you, you know. You think <laughs> you had a bad, let me tell you. And so there was a little bit of that, but I, um, and not that this is positive at all, but that always motivated me because it always just made me so angry. You know, like, like I definitely had a massive chip on my shoulder and I had something to prove. You know, and I, and I think um, this is, you know, as I said in that talk, one of my strategies for getting over imposter syndrome is like, you know, I'd feel like an imposter and I feel like I don't know anything and I'd be and all these things. And then somebody would tell me, like, I don't think you know what you're talking about. And then I would be pissed, you know, <laughs> then I'd get angry. And then, you know, and I think that that is kind of uh, my way of getting over it was by challenging it. So that's why I feel like it was so internally generated, like left in, alone in a room, I would be crippled. Anyone challenge me, then I would be like, oh yeah, you know, let me demonstrate how much I know. And so it was, yeah. It, yeah, no, I mean, I think that that, uh, so for me, now that I'm not saying that has to work for everyone, but that that is was kind of motivating for me. And so that was a very common thing. And, um, and I do, and now I've become a little bit more learned about implicit bias. And I think that that is still a very real thing. I still think uh, if you're a physiologist and you're, if you're a woman and you're a physiologist and let's say you submit a grant that's got physiology and anatomy in it, they're going to, and you have a collaborator, they're going to 
that's a male, they're going to assume that the collaborator did the recordings, you know, or if there's like a bit analysis component. And again, not because like, I'm not, I, this is implicit, right? So it's because they haven't, most of the people they've seen who are physiologists or male and, you know, maybe women are more likely to do anatomy, something like there is some, that's the statistics of the world they grew up in. And so I think all you have to do is just say, you know, when I did this recording, like just in your grant, you just have to just put a couple I just like a little bit when you give a talk, you know, when I did this recording, when I wrote this analysis code, when I and and then it's gone, right? Because it's implicit. And I think people, many people are not explicitly say sexist about it. And so you just have to plant those little seeds, right? And then their implicit bias will go away. So I do think and that's a strategy I think that I I have used, I used a lot, particularly early in my career, I would make very clear that I'm the one who had done the physiology. I'm the one who had, you know, written this image processing code, like just little, you know, subtle, explicit things. But that I think is to overcome that. And, and I, and I would say that, and sitting on a lot of review panels, um, I do think for that reason, again, it's more subtle that women, if there, if there's a challenging, a technically challenging experiment, then it's more likely for the review panel to say, you know, we need more preliminary data. I'm not quite sure she can do it. And, um, and, uh, and so, you know, the, so I do think there's a little bit to it. And again, if you put in those, like, I, I would say, let's say for writing a grant, I would say these are, I would explicitly say these are technically challenging experiments, but I'm up for it because I have done X. I mean, I would like literally have a sentence that mm -hmm. said that. And, and I think, um, because I, I like to think that people are not, are no longer explicitly sexist like they used to be. And so this is just eliminating that implicit bias. Do you think there's something though about maybe the way like men write grants differently? Like, do you think that men maybe already write that way and it's a habit women have to get into? Or do you think because of maybe implicit bias, they just don't have to write that way because there's an assumption they can do it? Yeah, I would say that um, they don't have to write that way. Like, I think it's a little bit, and it's really hard to generalize. I mean, because there are, like I said, there are, um, uh, so people might assume, people are more likely to assume that uh, a man can uh, do a physiology experiment um, than a woman. Like, just if you were to change the names, you know, it might get evaluated differently. But, um, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I guess I don't know how to answer that. So I don't, I don't think that, yeah. So they don't have to worry about that. I would say women still have to worry about that. Um, there are more and more, this is really just about physiology, but now many of the leaders, you know, in the field and in particularly in calcium imaging and stuff are women. And so I, I do think that implicit bias is going to go away. You know, you, you can just do what, uh, maybe what men have done in the past, which is just give your papers, you know, just give your <laughs> whatever <laughs> your list of evidence that you've done it, show your preliminary data maybe don't say I quite as much, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I think it still is, um, still might be necessary for a little bit longer. Yeah. And, and I guess I'd say in Germany, probably still quite necessary because there really are not that many women in leadership positions there still. So, sorry, <laughs> they're working on it. Yeah, it's, yeah. slowly pushing. For slowly it. pushing. So I found it really interesting what Marla said about um, the grant writing and the differences in how men and women write their grants and how this already influences then the success or not success that uh, women can have in science, right? That's amazing. And how also this plays together with the implicit biases that we all have. One of the things I wondered was, why is there this assumption maybe that women aren't as capable? And I, I think it's really coming down to what Marla said about implicit bias, because I expect for a long time that it was only or, or nearly only men in science. Um, and people are just subconsciously more comfortable to maybe bet on what they know, which for a long time would have been other men. And so maybe they just see themselves more in applicants who are men and think, ah, I could do it. So I bet he can do it too. Do you think it's that simple? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I guess to some degree, maybe, but then um, 
I also think that it's more complicated than that and that sometimes um, even in, in cases where the gender is not known, there are problems. So for instance, there is a study from the MIT that showed that even when the reviews for um, the reviews for grants are blinded, so the people don't know if it's a woman or a man applying, um, there's still problems. So in blinded reviews where the gender is not known, applicants are evaluated um, differently. So men are more favorably evaluated, and this was due to the word choice, actually. So I found it quite astonishing that even though the gender is not known, there's something in the way that women write their grants, as Marla said also, that is just the word choice that, that makes a problem for the way the grant is written. So in case you're interested in that, in this study, we will put the link for it in the episode description. So I don't, I don't know if you caught this, Sandra, but, but one of the things Marla also mentioned was, was having imposter syndrome. She, she mentioned getting over imposter syndrome. And I'm wondering, like, have you, have you heard of that before? Have you heard of imposter syndrome? Yeah, I actually heard about it when I was reading a bit about Marla and about her background. And I found a video of her on YouTube where she was openly talking about it. And yeah, so basically imposter sy syndrome is that people who are totally qualified don't really believe that they deserve their position or their achievements or even that other people are overestimating their abilities. And at any moment, they will learn that they are a fraud. So especially over very well achieving or overachieving people have that. So like every scientist, yes. <laughs> I feel like every scientist must have this. I guess, can you give us a little introduction to maybe when you realized you had imposter syndrome? Yeah, I mean... So I guess I didn't know what it was called, right? So, um, but, you know, I, so I come from, uh, I was raised in a very working class family. I had never met a scientist. Um, and, and here I was getting a physics degree, you know, from Berkeley, like who the hell did I think I was, right? And even <laughs> though I was getting like A's in all my classes, it was just like, who did I think I was, you know? So the whole thing just seemed crazy. And it seemed crazy when I was in graduate school, I mean, my mother would refer to my degree as a PDH, right? She didn't know what a PhD was. Like, no one in my family knew what a PhD was. And, uh, and so it was kind of like a dual, you know, I just, and so I didn't talk to anyone. I, you know, I didn't really like to associate with people too much. I was in physics where there are um, very few women. I have to tell you, when I was in uh, um, thinking about whatever career in physics, there were no female uh, professors of physics in Germany, in the entire country. There was not a oh, single wow. Wow. woman professor of physics. Okay, that's how bad it was. So mm -hmm. and in the US, there were very few. And I hope maybe one of your listeners will tell me I was wrong, but that was certainly one of the things that I heard, <laughs> that it was very hierarchical and um, and there were no women in that hierarchy. So, mm -hmm. so there weren't many women, but, you know, and maybe that was what was feeding partially into it, but it was mostly, I just came from this family and background where there was no precedent for this. And so it just, so I just assumed I was going to get fired at some point. And I probably felt that probably until I got tenure, you know, which was a really long <laughs> time. So, um, but, but I didn't care because, you know, maybe the advantage of being part of a kind of a working class family is that, you know, jobs, you get fired from jobs and you look for another job, right? So at some point this party was going to end, you know, and, and then I was going to have to go, you know, find a job, a different job. And that was fine, but I was enjoying it as long as it lasted, but I never thought it would last. I mean, never, I had no vision of it. And so I just kept going. And I, you know, when I was in graduate school, so in, in physics departments, when you pass your quals, um, it's a very big, uh, it's a, bigger deal than I would say it is in, in biology. Um, it, it's, a, it's a, you know, there's a lot, there were a lot more exams that you take in physics. There's a exam at the end of your second year where you take classes and there's a, there's an oral part to it and a written part to it. And I got through that and that felt like a miracle. 
Um, and then when I passed my calls, that really was, it's kind of late in your PhD. And then you just kind of have to write your thesis after that. And that was a moment that was when I like, like, <laughs> you know, that meant I knew I was going to graduate. It's like, oh my God, you know, I'm actually, this is, I'm actually going to get, you know, a PhD mm -hmm. in physics. And that was really kind of amazing. So I'm a, I, I always make my students celebrate their quals because for mm -hmm. me, that was such a big moment. <laughs> no, it's like, wow, maybe, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to keep fooling them. Right. And um, yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So I had it for a long time. I still have it occasionally. Um, but I just, you know, do you feel that like part of what maybe contributed to me to feeling like an imposter was not having female mentors, like really seeing yourself represented in the physics community? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that had something to do with it. But you know, I, um, yes, I'm sure that's something to do with it. But it feels like uh, such an internal thing, like, it, you know, such an internally generated thing. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how much of the external world was going to influence mm -hmm. it. You know, I mean, I, I have seen when you talk to people, you know, you can talk to older male faculty who come from generations of faculty who suffer from it, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not, and everything in the world has told them that they should succeed, except inside they're like, well, you know, I'm not really that smart or I'm not really that whatever. Or I know my professor, you know, my parents are professors, but ugh, you know, I'm, I'm not as smart as they are. I mean, whatever. So I, I've seen it in um, many different uh, people. Um, and so it's, so I, I suppose there was some comfort in knowing when I learned how many people suffered mm -hmm. from it. Um, totally. This is also why I contacted you, actually, <laughs> or one of the big reasons because of this initiative picking brains from, I think it's Berkeley PhD students who started yeah. it, right? And obviously then I knew you already because we're in the same field, uh, neuroscience. Right. Um, but then I read this wonderful article about you and your career and um, how you went through your path and also that you suffered from imposter syndrome. And this is so refreshing to hear about that, because if you hear it from an established, well-known scientist, um, that even those people <laughs> um, have issues with topics like that, and then you feel like more understood and just, okay, it's not just me, it's normal. And I also know now from talking to a lot of colleagues that more or less everybody has that, right? And it's just nice yeah. to see that you're not alone. And that's it. Yeah, I think it's it's funny because I because I, I give a talk and I, it's in that uh, there's a link to it about imposter syndrome. I wasn't going to talk mm -hmm. about imposter syndrome in this particular seminar series. And it was triggered by talking to a young woman who is extremely accomplished. And she had just gotten a job at Google. Mm -hmm. And I mean, she had just gone through her she was so accomplished and she was actually an economist and an econometrics person. And then she was the daughter of one of my faculty friends. And then she had just gotten a job at Google and, and she just started talking about the imposter syndrome she had. And that's when I realized it's like, Oh my God, this still exists. Like even for, I look at young women now and you're all so confident and have accomplished so much that I think, oh, it, it must be gone. And so I was like, oh, it's still here. So <laughs> oh, I went no, around and asked yeah. all these faculty about, and everyone said they had it. And then the morning I was giving my talk, I asked my husband, who's a neuroscientist, if he suffered from it. And mm -hmm. he said, no, <laughs> there, is, there is, and I, he's not a particularly arrogant person. He just doesn't. <laughs> so there are people out there who don't have imposter syndrome. I'm married to one of them, but it's, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and so it's, it's lurking in a lot of different people, but it is possible to exist without it. <laughs> you said it's gotten easier since you got yeah. tenure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause they can't fire you. Right. So my fear <laughs> was I was just going, I mean, unless I commit a felony, but they, which, you know, but they, but I'm not likely to do, but yeah. So that, that's probably when it went away, but I think, and this is what I would say to all of you, I mean, is to hear that you know here are the compliments right here are all the things that should be validating and don't make excuses for them right and i think that that is um uh, that helps right to just like take a moment when i don't know i get a good teaching evaluation someone says nice talk you know like anything take it like listen to it and take it and, and mm -hmm. uh 
Um, and then try not to, because you're going to wallow on the criticism. So you might as wallow just a little bit on the victories. And even if it's a, you know, nice job yeah. on your lab meeting, right? That, uh, yeah. That's true. And maybe also from the other side, make more compliments. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> like if, yeah. if you mean them seriously, right? Very often we just think, oh, that was a great talk, but you're not saying anything or just anything similar like that. And it, it, sometimes it means the world to the people if you just tell them, even if it's just a small thing. It always means the world to people. I mean, I do it all the time and, and, I, and it's not false, right? Like it's, you can't just, uh, right. But always I would recommend, here's now a little bit of professional advice. It's always good to do that, but to say something um, substantive about what the content was, right? So mm -hmm. you can say that was a good talk. I really liked how you explained X or I found this question fascinating mm -hmm. because I do, um, uh, uh, you don't necessarily, I think it's good professionally because it also shows you as the complimenter um, is uh, that you're thinking about what they said and not mm -hmm. just that you liked the sound of their voice, but it's also a more meaningful compliment, right? So when you've communicated your science effectively, even if it's just like, I really liked hearing about the retina, I've never thought about the retina before and now I realize <laughs> it's interesting, you know, even just like something like that is, is a, it's a deeper compliment and it also... I think reflects well on um, on you, right? So I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. I want to know, like, when you were thinking about applying for neuroscience as a physicist, did you ever have a thought in your mind, like, I'm not trained to do this, I have no business going into this oh other God. field? Yes. Okay. Yeah. No. And you did I, it anyways. Yeah. I mean, it's it was terrifying. So that was the other thing I talked about in my imposter syndrome talk. One of the ways to get rid of it is to actually be an imposter, right? And I actually <laughs> was an imposter, right? I was actually giving lectures, you know, in front of biologists about, you know, signal transduction and uh, how the kidneys work. And I knew, you know, I knew nothing about these things. So I actually was an imposter and, um, <laughs> and it, you know, and so, you live the nightmare, right? Of like actually being the imposter. And I lived, it wasn't pretty, but I lived and, and, uh, but it was that really fed it big time, you know, and, yeah. and to this day, <laughs> to this day, they're asking, you know, sometimes I've been asked to be say chair of a molecular and cell biology department, right? They, they have been asked to be chair and I will say, I don't know molecular, and cell, you know, I, this is not my truth. <laughs> I cannot be chair of this department. And that is, that could be, that's, I think that's real. I don't think it's imposter syndrome. I feel like that's just being an imposter. But, um, <laughs> but I, you know, I also know that physiology is a part of biology. And so, you know, I can just represent that. But it was still, <laughs> it's like, it still comes up. It's like, you know, I don't have formal training in this. It's all just, yeah, neuro, I'm fine. I'm totally fine in, in the neuroscience department. But being in a, in a molecular and cell biology department makes me feel a little bit like an imposter. So maybe once you're an imposter there long enough, eventually it will <laughs> go away. It's... I mean, I guess the point is you are, we are sometimes imposters, right? And that's fine, right? Just, just, you know, I'm an imposter when I teach the kidneys to students. Um, but, you know, I have learned enough material for that lecture and I can communicate that material to them. I do have some understanding. I don't have a deep understanding, but I have a, enough of an understanding to be able to teach. And that is all you have to do. And so sure, I'm an imposter, but I'm not because right? I've yeah. taught them something. And I think that that's something that just uh, can get rid of imposter syndrome is that we all kind of are and just mm -hmm. let it go. I find it funny that uh, if the two things you found have cured your imposter syndrome were actually being an imposter <laughs> and then being called an imposter were the two things. <laughs> that did it for you. Right. Actually, the thing that did it for me, and I think I tell that story too, I think what really cured me of it was a conversation I had with one of my colleagues in MCB, you know, this woman who's incredibly successful, MacArthur Genius Fellow, just got some big award, came to my office. Oh my God, I got this because I'm a woman. I'm like, you're being ridiculous. You're super successful. And I said, oh, I just got invited to give this big talk. They just did it because I'm a woman. And she's yelling at me saying, oh, you're being ridiculous. You're very successful. And I am like, listen to us. Like we are just being, we're both tenured faculty at Berkeley and we're still doing this. We, you know, we got to stop. Right. And I think that probably was what cured me better was how ridiculous it sounds. Like it's just a waste of energy. <laughs> so that I like to think of was the moment I was cured.
So, Sandra, did you did you find it kind of shocking to hear that someone as accomplished as Marla has had imposter syndrome for so long and that she even says she still some days feels it. I found this really surprising. So I was actually really surprised that Marla has it as well. The imposter syndrome is such an accomplished um, professor in her position, but at the same time, it was also a relief to me because um, to some degree, it just taught me that that it probably has nothing to do with what you really can and with your abilities because if you're a professor, obviously you are competent and you're not a fraud. <laughs> so It makes me feel more normal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It also makes me feel more normal. And it just it tells me, okay, it has something to do with what you're really thinking in your inner mindset. And we have to work on that and also help each other maybe to improve in the way we think about ourselves. I, I, I found it interesting what, what Marla was was saying that maybe underrepresentation of women in a field can kind of lead to feelings of imposter syndrome because, you know, we might assume that we were just maybe a diversity hire. Mm -hmm. Kind of like she was saying in the end, ah, I only got this award because I'm a woman. And I really think that like this highlights the need to have more women in leadership positions so that when new ones are hired, they don't feel like they're there because they're a token woman. Like, they're there among other women. Yeah. So they therefore like can't just be there because they are a woman because yeah. there are many other women there. But I think more than just hiring more women, which we absolutely need to do, I think people need to be aware of how we talk about the women who are hired mm -hmm. to avoid giving their the impression that their position is undeserved. Like I've heard people make comments oh, I bet I didn't get this job because they needed to hire a whatever, you know, basically increase diversity. And it often just makes me think to myself, like, oh, God, is that what people think of me? That, like, I've only gotten here because I'm, like, because of my gender, mm -hmm. which, like, is so stupid because, like, all the data on this would suggest that I've actually gotten where I am in spite of my gender, not because of it. And so, I, I don't know. I find the whole thing yeah. <laughs> very confusing sometimes. Yeah. I, I also, I totally feel you, so I can totally relate to it also. And I, I think that this is kind of a burden we ha all have to take in this transitioning phase now from a time where there are really not enough women, especially in the leading positions, to a time where it's just normal that women are in leading positions as well, and it's more or less equal. So I really hope that this is just a temporary thing and really just for this phase uh, of transitioning into a more diverse and equal world. If you found what Marla said about imposter syndrome interesting or helpful, you can check out the video that we've, re that we've referenced in the interview by clicking the link in the episode description. For now, that's our show. We'd like to thank you for joining us and of course to our guest, Marla Feller. We'd like to leave you with a final piece of advice from Dr. Feller. So that's all from us. Until next time. Bye everyone. Bye. You know, the message I always like to give, you know, to young women is that there are many paths to becoming a scientist. There are many journeys you can take. You can take time off. You don't have to take time off. You can have kids. You don't have to have kids. You know, there's no right time. There's no right path. There's no, just do it your way. Offspring Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net and the science communication working group known as the Offspring Magazine. This episode was produced by Alison Lewis and Sandra Fendler. It was edited by Alison Lewis and Adrian Lahola Jomiak. The intro outro music is composed by Srina Gramkuma and the pre intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Cariso. The podcast series is hosted by Adrian Lahola Jomiak, Alison Lewis, Beatrice Landsberger, Nikolai Hermann, Sandra Fendler, and Srina Gramkuma with social media support by Nadia Pirogova. 
For any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phd.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.